So namaste and welcome to satsang. <clears throat> so um as always whatever has been um coming up all week for for this anger over and over. <clears throat> it's usually something that feels important to uh, speak about and to look into. And this week, um, I've heard many times um, <clears throat> from other body minds appearing in me that uh, the mind has been very, very active and uh, lots and lots of thoughts and overwhelm of thoughts. And <clears throat> When I was uh, in the same position, I remember this feeling of hopelessness that I would never be able to even find a way to deal with all of these uh, thoughts and transcend them, let them go, whatever. And I began to really um, eventually realize that the, the way I was trying to do it wasn't really working, um, looking at individual thoughts, etc. And this led to a, a search for what is the root of the mind? What is the root of thought and thinkingness? Um, <clears throat> what is the root of the um, tendency to think about things? Mind is a thinking machine, talking machine, one thought at a time. And its uh, its purpose, its role to a large extent is to produce thoughts most of those thoughts for most of us are very um, <clears throat> low in frequency, um, very repetitive, uh, and even sometimes nonsensical. So what's the fastest way then to get to the root of that? Is there a way to pull the root out from underneath the mind without having to look at all the thoughts it's having? Is there something that is the core of um, <clears throat> the mind, some energy, some key, something that when we pull it out, that the whole mind is uprooted in that. Because there's nothing wrong with the mind itself. Although if you feel like you're being bombarded with it, I remember that very clearly that it feels like there's a lot wrong with it. It feels like it's uh, my enemy and it's trying to attack me. <clears throat> But if we can uh, begin to understand the mind and why it thinks and how it thinks and how that is a distortion of actual reality, then we can begin to firstly understand it more, accept it more. And then when we're not fighting it so much, we can begin to see the root and begin to pull or dig at the root of the mind. What if there was one thing you could do or understand or see that would really uh, bring to light the whole cause of thought and thinkingness. Wouldn't that be worth spending some time looking at here today? <clears throat> <clears throat> so for me, when I really looked at what the, the nature and the purpose of thought was, it began to become clear over the um, weeks and months I was looking at this, that all thought and thinkingness is a movement away from reality. So reality is one and whole and indivisible. It is that in which the universe and all dimensions appear in. <clears throat> Even the universe is just a appearance arising inside this, that you are. Whatever this is, we don't really have a name for it, although we try to put millions of names to it, God, divine, awareness, pure sentience, <clears throat> parabrahman, supreme self, noumenon, um, consciousness, beingness, over and over and on it goes, emptiness, nothingness. And that is indivisible, even though it looks divided into many, many forms, infinite numbers. 
it's actually um, just one home, whole, home, <laughs> and seamless and indivisible. There's just parts of it where it's visible and parts where it's invisible. But it is one and the same thing. Some of the things that are visible to the human senses move around and talk even. Some are um, static, don't seem to move. And then there's the emptiness, the nothingness, the formlessness, the same way it appears. But it's all the same one thing, vast and infinite. Even beyond the definition of infinite. No beginning, no ending. Never started, can never stop. <clears throat> and just certain parts of it are perceptible to our human senses. And we call that form. So all thought, if you look at every single thought you could ever have, ever, or have ever had, has one thing in common. And that is that it's thinking about something else. What if the very act of thought or thinkingness, thinking about, is an artificial division in that which cannot be divided? Maybe that is what we're suffering from more than the actual thoughts. Can you have um, a thought about something um, <clears throat> that is uh, who you really are? Can you think about that vast, infinite mystery, formlessness, in which eons and yugas come and go, and they mean nothing, they're like, an afternoon for a human being. <clears throat> Can you think about that? What could you possibly think about? Your real nature that was here before the universe and is here appearing as the universe. And then to come to see that all thought then, <clears throat> whether it's about myself, or my awakening, or my um, sister, my uh, house, my cat, my thoughts, <clears throat> my emotions, your thoughts, your emotions, anything at all that I could think about is thinking about something other than me. Even if I think about awakening until I think about awakening. I am the awakening. I am being it. I can't not be it. And I still am it, even when I think about it. But I seem to create this subtle sense of it being outside of me, something I have to get to. <clears throat> My cat is me. My thoughts are me, just ways that I'm showing up. Yet when I think about them, suddenly there's this seeming division into me and other. So we, you're just here, we're here as everything, appearing as everything that could ever exist or has ever existed, a potentiality for an infinite unfolding that goes on literally forever of shapes and forms, not separate to this, just like waves arising on the surface of this, ripples. And in that, there is no division possible. None at all. <clears throat> it's not even come back together to be one, one whole. It's not all of its parts together. It is literally indivisible. If I take the emptiness in, this, uh, in the space between my hands, which even these are emptiness, but I can't divide this into two, can I? Or three or four. It's just you can't divide something that is formless. And then when we remember that all the forms are also made of formlessness, <clears throat> then even to say the space between my hands is totally nonsensical. Space, space. All objects are empty, emptiness, even thoughts. The root of all illusion then became clearer to me that it is this tendency or 
desire or capacity to um, imagine that there is other than this great supreme self, that there is something that could be other than it. Even time, even energy, even uh, future and past, when we think about them, we seem to make them separate. Maybe the very thinkingness themselves itself is uh, making it seem other than me. It seems like I'm here thinking about something else. I'm just here thinking about someone else, something, something else, some time else. And of course, there's nothing wrong with thoughts, but they're not really going to tell you anything about yourself at all, ever, because they're coming from the assumption that you are divisible and that you have divided yourself into lots and lots, infinite numbers of separate forms, beings. <clears throat> so when I started to really get this, I, pro I did what probably everyone does, is just start to reject thought and reject mind even more. Well, this is obviously, the whole mind is based in illusion, so I'm just going to put it over there and leave it be. But then I even realized the error of that. It's like the mind is appearing inside me. It's just another shape I'm making. <clears throat> and it's really just an energy, an energy that wants to think, that wants to try to uh, compare and analyze and ascertain and assimilate. And if I just leave that be, it doesn't really bother me. So can we then use this in our spiritual practice? How do we work with this information? We can begin to see that thought isn't bad or wrong. It's just going to emphasize a division where there is none possible. And perhaps the most painful division of all is the imagination that I am separate to. At some point I broke away from this uh, supreme self and somehow I've got to get my way back, find my way back. And in this idea that I broke away from the Supreme, I'm going to always feel limited and unworthy and all kinds of things like that. So just to see our indivisible nature and to recognize that thought is a movement away from that indivisible nature always a movement into separation and that separation isn't possible. Could we transcend the mind then in one big leap by looking at something again and again and again and again until it's like really clear? What is that thing then? Just that thought is not that important anymore. It's important to a separate being. It's not wrong mind let's not make it wrong because then we are saying right and wrong and we're divided again in our imagination only at least but it hurts like it's real thought is going to be um always trying to move into tunus that's its very nature thought is like uh looking at a still lake the surface of the water is completely still and calm. <clears throat> and then something moves in that, a thought appears in that stillness, that lake. And the very thought is going to create, arising is going to create ripples. So thought is desperately trying to get to that stillness. And its very nature and existence is a movement that's going to create some shape on the surface unless we see that thoughts are are that stillness they're made out of it so for me it became at one point really important to remember as often as i could that thoughts can't really say anything about me not the good ones not the attacking ones not the judgmental ones and they also can't tell me anything about you <clears throat> or awakening or anything and 
I didn't so much fire the mind. I just kind of give it a nice place to sit down there and just have a cup of tea and relax because it was off the hook at trying to figure out, figure out reality and how to make sure I'm safe and lovable and all those other things that we all want. <clears throat> how to find peace. How to find a, awakening. How to realize that in a deep way. How to live it. <clears throat> how to live as the one will... Just beginning to not give so much credence and value to thought without making it wrong. It's an old tool. And it's not really so valuable or important anymore. <clears throat> and in fact, it just becomes equal thought to every other phenomenon. I don't have any negative feelings about this laptop or the plants outside, or the sofa, or a particle of dust. Why should I have negative feelings about mind? It's just the same. It's just the same. Everything is equal. <clears throat> so applying this in our meditation, which we're going to do in a moment, and we're going to be in a moment, we're going to be meditation in a moment, when a thought arises in meditation, all we can actually let that do then is to come and go. <clears throat> when a thought arises um, in meditation, it seems to pull attention away from this, this that's here, this existence, this whatever this is. So if we can just gently foster in our meditation, cultivate this, I, I don't really want to go with this. I don't really want to go. I want to stay here as me. If that's going to tell me more about anything, just being myself is going to tell me more about anything than thinking about it. If the hundreds of billions of thoughts that we've ever thought have shown us anything, it's that thought isn't really going to reach a satisfying conclusion. And again, it's not wrong. <clears throat> it just is. Once we come to understand that the nature of illusion is that there's something possible called division inside you, separation. And that all thought is based in that root idea then you can literally jump over the mind, like you find yourself, whatever thoughts come, possible thoughts in the future, whatever you might be thinking now or have thought in the past, if you examine them all, you'll see, or even a few of them, they're all based in this idea of duality and division. So when a thought arises, and we notice that we've gone with that thought, our attention has gone to that thought. Just looking at the nature of the thought going, wow, that's, that's also in separation. I'm thinking about next week as if it's something different to this now moment. I'm thinking about what I forgot to do this morning as if that is something uh, different to this moment. I'm thinking about where I'm going afterwards and who I'm gonna see and I'm thinking about how to stop thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking about whether I've actually really understood what's been said and how to apply it. I'm thinking how to stop thinking and start being myself. Can any of that get you anywhere, really? And again, I have nothing against thought. It's just an outdated model. And we're going to upgrade to the latest version of ourselves, which is also the eternal version. to this, this that is here. Right now you're here. So let's take this into meditation if you want to, just for 15, 20 minutes. If you want to close your eyes, you can, you don't have to. If you want to uh, get nice and comfy. And we're just going to practice, funnily enough, being here. The recognition that I am 
I exist, I'm here. So when we say the words I am, either in our mind or verbally, that which hears them or sees the words I am is the real I amness. And you might say, well, that's just me. I hear it. I am. I hear it. No big deal. Totally okay. Just keep your attention on it as often as you can. What is it that's hearing these words? That's here and present. It hears the breath moving, the wind blowing. You are here as all of this. You are already your indivisible self. You are appearing as the universe itself. And every time a thought arises, just a gentle preference. I'd rather stay here. I actually like here. Not pushing anything away, least of all the thoughts, just a preference to be here. We can call that intention, desire, devotion. When a sound happens, it doesn't make us imagine division when the dog barks, only if we think about the dog. Whatever we encounter through our senses is just appearing and disappearing. Just shapes that you're making. So just noticing whatever arises and staying here, preferring here. Just this. Whatever sounds arise, sensations in the body, thoughts, Just let them come and go. <clears throat> and just gently reaffirming, I like to be here. I am. Coming back gently to that 
I amness, that existence, that here-ness. We'll spend a few moments in silence. And during that time, when the pull of attention moves with thoughts, just coming back when you can, preferring this, this that you are.
So whenever you are ready and only if you want to, you can open your eyes if they're closed. Begin to move around if you need to, have a stretch, have a drink. <clears throat> So in the meditation, <clears throat> we're just practicing preferring, gently preferring, gently intending, gently cultivating this habit to prefer what we really are to anything that we can imagine about ourselves. <clears throat> meditation then becomes not a chore anymore, it becomes falling in love with that which is real. Every time that we sit to meditate, we can fall deeper in love with that that we are. Even if our body is in pain or restless or agitated or if mind is agitated, whatever it is that's moving, the body the mind, the energy, the emotions, the external environment. Just noticing that and bringing attention back to this. This that is, and this that in which all is appearing. <clears throat> so, um, Hope you um, experienced yourself in an ever deeper way in meditation and in life. Satsang really is not an event. It's a, it's a way of being. It's a way of moving through our life. <clears throat> so I will read a couple of questions that have been sent in, um, answer those. And I'll take up to three uh, people online here live. If you have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I'll go to these questions first and then I'll come to you online here. <clears throat> this uh, first question says, uh, Dear Helen, thank you so very much for all that you give. I just signed up for your graduate program. And I'm so grateful for everything you share with us and the way you do it. Thank you so very, very much. So just as a note, our graduate program is just a community for people that want to go deeper into what we're learning here. And it's open to everyone, no matter how, whether you're completely new to these teachings or whether you've been around them for years. Um, <clears throat> and it is a, a, a vast and growing family. So um, I have a question from my daily life with my young children. We have some tasks at home that need to be done, such as emptying and filling the dishwasher and cleaning up the kitchen, etc. I've done a lot of the work with Byron Katie, <clears throat> and it really speaks to me when Katie talks about how after her awakening, she began to do all these things herself and do them with joy, where before she had scolded her children. She says that after she'd started doing it with joy, the children started doing it on their own. However, she would happily do it, even if the children did nothing. She does it for her own sake. She tells us <clears throat> about lots of examples of this, also with her ex-husband who did not follow her example. This sounds like freedom to me, but my mind and other people say, there's no difference between mind and other people, by the way. My mind and other people say that I do my children a disservice. I should teach them to do these things if they're going to have an easier life than, and they should do what I tell them to do. They, they do something, but definitely not what I would like if we have to share the tasks. So I sometimes end up getting angry and it drains me and brings me distance between my children and me. It speaks to me to surrender myself completely to doing these tasks with joy and having peace inside of me. 
when the children don't do it instead of spending my energy trying to get the kids to do what they agree to because I want it. It's like my mind has lots of opinions which make me angry and unclear uh, when I think we have to share the tasks. I also think it'd be good training to do it with peace, if not joy, since I don't really mind the tasks either. I just care more about our home being nice than my children do. Do you have any thoughts on this? When my wish is peace, love and joy for us all and a nice home. Can I say that wanting them to do exactly what I want Excuse me, I can say that wanting them to do exactly what I want uh, hasn't worked. I do hear this is about the right thing to do. Could it be to surrender to do the tasks peacefully, if possible, when the children don't do them and continue my awakening and ask who it is that gets angry? Who is it that's in doubt? Who is it that does not do what they should? I am the whole situation, the tasks on my children. So if I remain formless, and clear, it will fall into place. Could that be the answer? <clears throat> Could I ask, what is a task? What is a nice home? A dishwasher, etc. Love to you. Well, as a mother of four, uh, I so remember this, and it almost um, drove me insane. And um, I don't really want to comment on Byron Katie's work. It is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But I'd like to speak from my own experience as always um and for me whatever i everything i whichever thing i tried um a lot of bliss today so <laughs> speaking is a little um whichever thing i tried it just um fell on deaf ears um and for a long time i blamed my own self that if i was just more uh a better mother or um if I was more awakened, then you know I'd be able to have what I want um, in the in the world, but uh, that really didn't work. And also trying to figure out the right thing to do didn't work. And um, you've even said here, um, let me find it. I get that this is um, about um, finding the right thing to do. So is that ever going to really work? Can you choose in this next moment, if you have to do something in the house, your body will either do it or it won't. And your children's bodies, which are also you, will either do it or they won't. Words will be spoken or not. Peace will be felt or not. Joy or not. Frustration, anger or not. What if the only thing here that's um, uh, that this all is a reflection of is the fact that we think that other beings are possible. And you say that you know that you are your children, that are tasks, et cetera. But if we've really allowed that to go deep, 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 what is there to think about or decide about? Can you think about your children if they are just this here-ness, this I am-ness, and the dishwasher, and the tasks, and even the peace and the joy? So any thought going on around it, trying to figure it out, like we were saying at the beginning of satsang, is that ever going to be effective? You say, to remain as the self, the formlessness, absolutely I agree, but really be the formlessness, not halfway, don't be the formlessness and then think about what to do to resolve this. Just be the formlessness. Let go of trying to sort this out at all. And let the shapes arise within you as they arise. Your body, children's bodies, the dishwasher, everything. And also the shape of your desire to have them help you more. Let that arise too. It doesn't belong to you, it's just arising inside you, that desire too. And even if there's thinking that's going on inside you, like, what should I do? What should I do? How do I solve this? Let that arise too. And just notice that in which it all appears, all of it, as often as you can, like we were just doing, like we were just being, and see what happens. If there's no division possible, there's nobody to think about and nothing to think about. And 
mind says, well, that isn't going to solve the problem, but give it a try. Give it a try and see what happens. When I first really started to understand this, my actual thinking about how to solve this problem is what is what's perpetuating it, really. My desire has arisen that I'd like to be more help for this body mind from the bo other body minds in the house. And, you know, it's good for them to learn responsibility, etc. But by thinking about it, the more awakening deepens, the less effective anything you do is going to be. So you might speak to them and nothing happens, nothing comes from it. There aren't any others to think about. Is this problem a real problem for you then? And what happens when you just remain really as the formlessness? If thoughts are talking about it, let it let that go on, but you stay here as this, allowing everything to arise and move and change, including the desire. Doesn't mean you're not going to get your desire. It means you're actually going to be able to allow it to manifest. See what comes from there. Wonderful. I'll read one more quickly. Um, lots of misconceptions have been emptied out, but there is one big thing, one thing that seems to be deeply rooted in me. I have been disconnected <clears throat> and an outsider all my life. I've managed to hide my inner turmoil and vulnerability through creating an image of myself as being in control and on top of things. A certain pride of being special has grown out of that. The weed of self-importance seems to be very difficult to deconstruct, as it would mean the end of me. Even if I know it will not be the end of me, it still feels impossible to undress completely. I have listened to your contemplation video, but I do not seem to get underneath my own protection mechanism. Uh, thank you so much for addressing this question in Satsang with deep gratitude. <clears throat> well, the only remedy I ever found for feeling special um, is to deeply see what is actually real. And I've felt special for a long time. Um, uh, my whole life, I've been able to see things and realize things uh, energetically and much more. Um, which rather than making me feel special, made me feel like um, a freak for a long time. And then I realized uh, in my 20s, I could make some money out of it. And I did. Uh, and felt very special for a long time. But eventually, I just didn't want that anymore. <clears throat> and the only thing that undid it is the recognition of who I really am. That which is indivisible. And uh, literally, indivisible means not two, ever. Not possible to be even two, or three, or four, or billions, or infinite numbers of forms. So self-inquiry is a more direct route here for you to recognize that which is indivisible. And I was talking about it at the beginning of this satsang. You cannot divide something that has no shape. How would you do that? How are you going to cut it, snip it? You can't. And everything is made of this. <clears throat> everything so if you want to undo that specialness just to realize either you're special if you're special everyone is they must be because it's all you don't even try to get underneath the protection mechanism just try to understand why it seems to be there the downside of feeling special <clears throat> all feeling very unspecial, very unworthy. It's always the same. I feel separate to everything else in existence. And that's why it hurts. And the separation um, automatically grows upon itself a protection mechanism. And um, it can be hard to let that down. Um, if you really want me to smash through this, I can be very direct and say you think you've managed to hide yourself you never managed to hide yourself it's just that everyone else has been too busy lost in their own thoughts also about themselves and about you to actually ever see you and awakened being so straight through you all the time there's no way an ego can fool the infinite self there's no defense against that that is looking through your eyes and my eyes and why would you want one 
I know it's say I'm not saying that to expect you to automatically let this down, but when you realize you're protecting something that does not exist, this separate self, this projection of me, it's a, a hallucination that seems very real. And you're also uh, utterly wrong, um, which I hope is a good thing to hear, that you have managed to uh, hide your inner turmoil. Uh, the ego's troubles and challenges are like an open book to the infinite self because it is showing up as ego and to any awakened being and every awakened being who of course would never judge and have been there. I've been there, definitely. And I remember this horrible, horrible moment, but very liberating where I realized I never hidden myself ever. There was just a nice thought that gave me some comfort, but it was never true ever. How can you hide something that doesn't exist? It's just not possible, right? And with that, the protection mechanism just falls away because why would you need it? People who are still believing in separation are so lost in their own world between their ears, they can't even mostly hear what you're saying. It's the wonder any human um, relationships have any success at all. Such is the nature of illusion and how seductive it is. We're more in love with the world between our ears, the thoughts, and it's not coming from judgment and literally being there, than we are with actual reality. Um, <clears throat> which filters everything we hear. We hear it through our beliefs about reality. So nobody's ever met you, actually, except an awakened being. And they'll see right through any defense anyway. Defense is just uh, non-existent, like the separate cell. And I'm being very direct here, just because I really feel when I'm reading this, I get this real deep sense. You just want to smash it, right? You only need to protect something if you think it's there and it's been useful. And it really has never actually worked. So it's the kindest thing I can say. <laughs> okay. I uh, will go to Don <clears throat> when you're ready. Um, Hi, Don. This is a, good morning. Um, thank you for the beautiful talk this morning. That was really great. I really am, um, enjoyed what you were saying about thoughts, you know, and um, I... I want to just ask you, you know, I think you've, I've been awakening around my situation with my family and, um, and now, you know, I have a lot of gratitude that I'm, that whoever this Don being is, is so stubborn. He needed, needs all of this. To, oh, didn't we all, didn't we all, that we all, yeah. until we don't, yeah. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I have a lot of gratitude and I guess I continue to need all that. Um, I don't seem to be able to get my shirt straight. <laughs> um, thank you for mirroring that. And um, so anyhow, I, I was wondering where, how was the thinking uh, that these beings or perceived beings when there's no separate beings anyway, how is that dynamic working if or is it just my projection working and I'm letting my my ego is finally letting down enough for me to see who I really am and that's the that's the only thing that's happening here or is or is there some or are there other beings in the universe that are helping me along the way since there's no other beings there's other <clears throat> there there are no other beings but there are other expressions of your own self that are helping you just like this conversation we're having now or anyone you talk to or there are countless beings without a without a um physical body that um countless beings without a physical body that are helping all of us all the time if we will let them um and the thought structure is 
mostly getting in the way of that. The more I think about other people and other things, the more I feel separate to them and therefore unable to let that help in, let that wisdom in, the more I'll feel I have to do it myself. And that myself will refer to just one body and mind. Okay, that helps. It's a relief, right? I don't have to get this done myself. There's a whole universe of resources. If I can just soften a little and let that in. Well, yeah, and what you said this morning about thoughts was really very illuminating for me around that. The really like, okay, when I'm in this thought, um, that's separating me automatically. And I don't need that separation. And I don't need to do all that thinking. So, and, and you just... can never get a resolution anyway, right? That's the next thing that becomes obvious. I'm thinking in duality, but the truth is non dual. How can I ever resolve anything that I need to resolve through thought? And again, I have right. nothing against thought and mind. Let's not make it wrong. It's just, it's not the best tool, is it, for us now, seeing who we really are? No. And somehow in admitting my family is me, they're just other ways I'm showing up. Everyone on this satsang is me. Everyone I would ever meet and everything I would ever meet is also me. By seeing that clearer, clearer and clearer, somehow these problems just resolve themselves. Mm -hmm. That's really what's happening, right? It's not that we've fixed any problems you have with your family and we're fixing, it's just Resolving by itself, when we let ourselves uh, get out of the way with not not subscribing to the thought process, it might still be going on, but not subscribing to it so much. Not so interested in it, but also not rejecting it. Right. And as I soften, I can see their perspective of the separate, the other expressions i can see other expressions so and you can also it, it becomes clearer why why people are so convinced of their own attitudes and opinions how they see the world especially if they're not on the pathway because they are utterly convinced that they're separate and they're utterly convinced that you're separate to them so a lot of compassion arises um <clears throat> about their perspective because it starts to, you, as you start to come out of it, you go, wow, I was so lost in that for so long. And it's so convincing, right. so convincing. And everyone else is still kind of lost in that for a while. Right. Thank you. That was really delightful and a great, great um, satsang today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's lovely to see you coming out of it and softening. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Priscilla, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Hi, Helen. How do you pronounce it? Priscilla. Priscilla, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can help me um, be clearer on um, this the noumenon let's just say um i'm noticing i'm using the 14 doorways and the dissolving the ego and um i find that there's such a um intense wanting to fall into where I always have gone in meditation, which began originally as a mantra, although within a short time, there wasn't hearing the mantra sound. It just was this, the most I can describe it is it's um, maybe like a sense of basking. It just really, um, 
like basking in love, like it just being with someone you love and it's you know, I'm speaking. Um, you know, there is uh originally the the idea of letting well the the habit of letting go of thoughts and in this I don't know if it's a place or a state or in this um whatever it is um thoughts just um are there or are not and you know sometimes there will be a realization oh that's I really have gone off on that and come mm -hmm. back. But um, I think most of the time they're they're just sort of quietly like background music or something. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of like, is is it okay to be there or do I need to like I'm wondering if you could ask questions so that I can get a sense of can look at at it from the sense of uh, the questions that need to be asked about it. So what what is the challenge then when you're meditating is there a um do you feel like you're not going deeper or oh no it's it's doing it the way i'm talking about it, it's very deep always has been and very <laughs> um um lovely um but i haven't over the years really had a, a sense it hasn't maybe occurred to me this is what I am uh -huh. and so it's kind of like oh, could I actually be that do I have what sort of almost do I have a right to be that am I looking at you know am I looking at this wrong what's up let's let's do a little self-inquiry then if you want to let's yeah uh, yeah if you're up for it so <clears throat> this um this you that's wanting to to well, it's the, the I that meditates, let's just say, whatever that is. What is it? Can you find it when you look? Let's look together and see. Because there's a sense I'm meditating and I'm experiencing mm -hmm. this bigger version mm -hmm. of whatever this is. Mm -hmm. right. This this that is is clearly here, but there also seems to be an I that's trying to get right. to it. Let's just see if we can really right. nail that down. Where, What is it? Where is it? Uh, it's, it's not anything. Um, it's not a, an entity. It's not a separate. Um, Can't find a, a thing that's you. No, there's, object, yeah, right? there's no thing. What do you find then when you look for I? Uh, presence. How big is that presence? Is it an object? No, no object, no size. No size, size less. Is it your presence or just presence? Yeah, that is where the, there's something that wants it to be my presence. Just have a look then <clears throat> and see if you can find that thing that wants to own it. Really put the microscope on the one that wants to say my presence. What what is that that says my? Yeah, it's um... I constructed. Um... Something it's not. 
Yeah, thought patterns. So it's just thoughts. It's not an actual entity, is it, that could claim ownership of anything? It's we looked, we couldn't find a someone. Let's look again. Is there anything about you that could claim ownership of anything? Are you some something that could say me and presence? I'm doing really well here. No, there isn't. There isn't any way from here. There's no way to say me as in presence. Just, just what then? Just presence. Yeah. So do you need to waste any time trying to get rid of that which says mine if it isn't really there? Can you get rid of it? You know, there's... Kind of a, maybe a s sense of compassion or something mm -hmm. like for the feeling of it. Yeah, something is spinning its wheels, trying to get to this presence. Yeah. When we actually look, all this frantic trying and trying and trying is just a thought, an energy or something, right? Not an actual person. Yeah. And now let's let's go to the presence itself. Is that presence trying to get rid of anything? No. Does it really care even if something says right. mine? It doesn't mean? have. Um, it, yeah. So, having seen this, is your problem still valid for you? Even this greatest problem of all that the mind can cook up, which is, how do I stop feeling separate to it? You just kind of sidestep it, right? I am that. Yeah, it's, it's like there's an awareness of the wanting to claim it, the wanting to um, either be separate from it so as to feel it or to claim it so as to be it, but it isn't. Um, because there's this little idea in it that if I really desire it, really want it, I'm somehow going to get closer to it, right? But that is actually creating an artificial division, and it hurts. Instead, it's easier just to realize I am it. I can't get any closer than that. I am it right now. This presence, I am it. Everything is it, and it's showing up as thoughts and bodies and words and as a desire desire to you know something wants to say i did it i got it hmm. it's an impossible problem to fix eventually you just kind of step around it and just carry on being yourself yeah <laughs> wonderful just keep confirming a couple of times you might need to just confirm, I really can't find any entity that's trying this, all this tryingness and doingness. And there isn't anyone owning this desire. There's just desire arising. And watch from you. Beautiful. Well done. Thank you. Lovely to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Shankara, last but not least. Hello, Helen. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you, thank you. Very good. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you for yeah 
it's a real it's a blessing uh to get in touch with you <clears throat> which is my higher self kind of my illuminated self realized being and it's funny because uh, the questions i had uh waiting in row kind mm. of got answered so <laughs> It's amazing. Even the last one with the desire coming up, there's this burning desire for dissolving in the, in the truth or in the being that I am. Mm -hmm. Even that you uh, uh, enlightened kind of or shed light on it. And I kindly ask you to um, still maybe help me mm -hmm. <laughs> to get more established uh, and absolutely grounded in that truth that I am. Um, yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> but let's, let's look and see what you are then. Let's mm -hmm. explore. What are you? What do you find <laughs> when you look for yourself? Yes. Are you an object or someone? No, not really. Not Seem really or not at all? Not, yeah, seemingly there's a person, but the essence, no, it's no person. So seemingly, even for me now, it seems like there's someone sitting here using this body to talk and it's okay. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. it's just a, a seems to be. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any difference then between you and me? The big question, to take your time. Whatever it is that you are, mm -hmm. is it any different to what I am? No. No, because I am the only one here, kind of, the only being, like there's only being consciousness or presence, life, formless awareness. So do Absolutely. you, mm -hmm. do you then need to get more established and grounded in this? Mm, no your mind is going to disagree with that of course yes and <laughs> <laughs> yeah the mind still there's attraction to the mind you know i guess it's okay it's okay there might be for some time just um fueling the attraction to what is real that's all we're really doing in satsang we're just kind of increasing that devotion to what is real yeah and we do that just by gently seeing the limitations of the mind. Yes. The mind might always disagree with us here, that there's nothing mm. else for you to do. Yes. It's always suffering, you know, and always trying to get something, and it's really never satisfied. And it's an endless race. It's very exhausting for, for, for the mind, for the person, for the seemingly person. <laughs> But let's check again who you really are. <laughs> Is it affected by mind? No. Ever? Is it ever affected by anything? No. Never. Does it, this presence, this formless awareness, whatever we're going to call it, does it need to get rid of the mind? Mm, no. What is its to-do list for today, awareness? Huh? What what does it does it have a to do list awareness? <laughs> Things it needs to get done no, today. No, it's perfect. <laughs> it's nothing to do. <laughs> no. So mm. there's just a, a lingering thought being believed that the mind is affecting you. Yes. And that comes mm. from this lingering sense that I am a something, an object. Yes. Mm. So for me, I had to just look again and again. Mm. There's nothing substantial about me at all. Mm. The body could be destroyed, thoughts could be destroyed, the universe yeah. could be destroyed, and I remain always as I am. Yes. When I first would see that, there was still a little doubt. I felt like I didn't, I wasn't fully convinced. Yeah. Well, at first, there was a lot of doubt. <laughs> yes. As I kept mm. on seeing it, that doubt was just. Um, chipping away and it was going down from 99% doubt to 1% and some some point it was zero there's just absolute conviction 
Mm -hmm. So Just it's, fine. it's about yeah. dissolving the doubt, huh? kind of. Just seeing that whatever doubt mind mm -hmm. gives to you, whatever mm -hmm. mind says to you, does it apply to this infinite nothingness? Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we're so used to listening to mind and going, yeah, yeah, that's my, I'll take that, I'll take that on. Mm -hmm. And we just have to listen to what's presented to us and mm -hmm. see if that's true for who you really are. Mm -hmm. It feels very true for who we thought we were. Yes. Mm -hmm. So even this yeah, sense that I need to get more established in it. Yeah, it's illusion. It's it's very fine illusion, very like yeah. um it was very convincing for me because you yeah. look at the sages and they were utterly peaceful, blissful, mm -hmm. totally non-attached, and yet totally in love with all of creation. Yeah. And we look at that and we go, I don't feel like that right now. There must be more work for me to do. Yes. True. Maybe because I feel there's more work for me to do, I don't feel yeah. like that. Yes. Yeah. So just standing in yourself and listening to what mind says, but going, does that apply to me? Does that apply to me? Oh, wow. Nope, 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 <laughs> nope, nope. Yeah, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it comes down to just this, um, once you have seen who you are, uh, making a stand as that, meaning... Um, We'll, we'll listen to mind, we'll buy its problems, but as soon as we remember, we go, wait a minute, before I go running off trying to yeah. fix that, yeah. does it, is it real for me? Mm. Wow. Mm. And when you're really, really determined mm. to stand there as yourself, mm. you, you can just kind of look at mind like a flip book. Wow, look at all these problems I could have you know, flicking through the pages of a hundred million spiritual problems that I could have. Yes. Mm. Okay. Mm. My mind won't like the answer because it's too simple. Uh, and it'll say, it's not going to fix the problems we have, you know? <laughs> mm. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we will leave it there for today. Thank you so much. Um, everyone who sent the questions in. Uh, and if you do want to send a question and if you don't want to ask live online or you can't make a satsang uh, live, you can send it in via the website, helenhamilton.org. They're always read out anonymously as well. So there's another reason why people send them in. We don't put names to them. Um, so Thank you for being here with me, as if you could be anywhere else than here, but <laughs> namaste. Namaste. Wonderful.